If you're worshiping with us online today, make sure you have your communion supplies ready for that special time toward the end of our service. Please remember to submit your attendance to us each week. All you have to do is click the link in the pinned comments or the link that is in the video description if you are watching online. Or if you are here in person, there is a plaque in front of you on the pew that's in front of you that has a little QR code. All you have to do is pull the camera out on your phone, scan that QR code, and then select the appropriate form for you to fill out. But you can also access the bulletins and our online giving through that link. If you cannot get it to work, all you have to do is go to FCCPlano.org info. Children's Sunday School is starting back on Sunday, April 11th. So 1015 to 1115, Children's Sunday School in the Education Wing. Thank you so much to everyone who has been participating in the envelope fundraiser for our youth so far. But we still have a ways to go, so we have decided we are going to extend this fundraiser through the end of April, which means you just have to go to our link tree or FCCPlano.org slash info, click on the youth fundraiser button, and then fill out the forms and get registered, and then select an envelope for you to take down, and then you give that much to the youth. And again, this is to help us go on a retreat this summer where we will spend time in fellowship, prayer, worship, and of course, fun. Now that we're back at worship, some people have asked about giving. We're not passing the offering plate, but we do have these giving boxes. There's two of them in the narthex. But of course, whether you're worshiping here or at home, you can also give online. If you go to our church's website, look for the giving section, then it'll take you from there. Hi guys, my name is Jordan Palmer and I'm from the Outreach Committee. Our quarterly food drive is coming up and we'll be collecting items for God's Pantry and our blessing box here. Our next, our next food drive is... The time is from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. We'll be continuing doing contactless drop-offs, so all you have to do is just pull up and a volunteer will be there to get your items from you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. 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 He is risen indeed. He is risen. 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 He is risen indeed. He has risen. The tomb is empty. He has risen indeed. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Coming to the church. Fantastic to see everybody this morning. My name is Kyle Dennis. I'm the senior minister here at First Christian Plano, and we're so glad you've come to worship with us. One of the many things I love about Easter is that you have people in church who haven't been here in a while, people who've moved out of town, or family who've returned. Uh, today we even have some guests I met earlier who've been watching us online for a few weeks, and that did not discourage them, and so now they're actually here. So that's awesome. <clears throat> I see a couple that I married in the last year or so, glad to see them here. So it's just wonderful to be able to, to reunite and have a reunion kind of uh, on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday. So uh, I would encourage you, be sure and use the QR code or you can use the link tree if you're worshiping with us online, we'd like to welcome you as well. And also, whether you're at home or whether you're worshiping here with us, you can use, you can keep up with our Facebook chat. Just make sure if you have your phone here in the sanctuary that you have the sound turned totally off because we don't want the sermon coming in at different, different uh, speeds. Kind of like some of those He Has Risen. Some of those Sunday school classes were more in sync than others. It was good. It was good. Like the back row. Anyway, so uh, make sure that you have your sound turned off. But if you would like to sign in in the comments today, our hashtag is hashtag don't hold back. Hashtag don't hold back. 
So you'll, hopefully you'll see the significance of that a little bit later in the service today. But thank you so much for being here to worship, and let's prepare our hearts now as we begin. Please stand as you are able and join me for today's call to worship. The stone is rolled away. We look inside and see the tomb is empty. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Our salvation has come. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice. Jesus. 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth. Join me in prayer. God of promise, God of hope, joyfully we come this Easter morning with hearts that are grateful to you. You came down to earth to save us, to love us, and to show us how to live. In doing so, you have removed the sting of death. We have learned that the grave is only a journey to the presence of God. For your glory and purpose, may we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and healing. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Marshall Breedlove. I am the associate minister here at First Christian Church of Plano. And last Sunday, which of course was Palm Sunday, we told the amazing story of Jesus' triumphal entry using my mass collection of Funko Pops and Bobblehead Jesus. And uh, throughout the week, we have been telling a story of the last week of Jesus' life uh, every day, Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday. Holy Wednesday, then we go to Maundy Thursday, and then Good Friday. And today, of course, being Easter Sunday, we have one more story to tell. And today is going to be told by Christy Williams, who is one of our Worship and Wonder storytellers. Today is Easter, the day that we celebrate the mystery that Jesus died and God made him alive again. This is a tomb, a special place for the dead. Jesus' friends took his body from the cross and put it inside the tomb. 
and then they covered it with a large stone. Then an angel came. Mary Magdalene loved Jesus. She and her friends came to visit the tomb on Sunday morning. But when they arrived, they were scared and they were sad. Where is he? Where has he gone? The angel said, do not be afraid. Rejoice. He is alive. He is risen. Go tell the disciples that Jesus is alive. But Mary did not leave. She stayed and she cried, where is Jesus? And then someone said, who are you looking for? And he called her by name, Mary. Why are you crying? Mary recognized the voice. She turned around. It was Jesus. Jesus was alive. Mary Magdalene was so happy that she couldn't wait to share the joy with Jesus' friends. I have seen Jesus. He is alive. He is risen. I wonder what it was it like to hear the angel say, Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. I wonder what it was like to tell others that Jesus is alive and Jesus is risen. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing Jesus alive for us. Thank you for the time to celebrate. And all God's children said, Amen. This is a day of resurrection, a day of reflection, a day of inspiration, a day of gratitude, a day of joy. Today we celebrate the glorious love and grace that can come only from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a day we can search the face of Jesus in others, or we can let the light of Jesus shine through us so that others may see his face in ours. And how can we share his love with others? While we all know that Jesus loves a cheerful giver, usually we think of this strictly in monetary terms. But what about other ways to let his light shine? In 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, Peter tells us, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ all glory and power to him forever and ever. So as you prepare your monetary gifts, pray also for the gifts of time and talent that God has so generously given to you. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, on this blessed Easter morning, we thank you for all the gifts you have so generously given to us. We ask, dear Lord, that these ties be used to bless those in need, and we ask also that our daily actions emulate all the love and grace that you so willingly share. Please accept these gifts in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise 
praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. You may be seated. I see we have lots of children here. We even have some children in the balcony. That's kind of cool to be able to sit up there. So is anybody here, children or adult, planning on participating in an Easter egg hunt at any time today? Do we have any Easter egg hunters? Oh, I see one up there. Some. Who's ever been in an Easter, done an Easter egg hunt? I know some of us have. I was remembering years ago this morning, I don't know how many years ago it was now, maybe 20, I was serving in a church in Houston, and after a service on Easter Sunday, we went over to these people's house. They had a really big yard to have an Easter egg hunt. And one of the minister's sons was about two and a half, and uh, he didn't totally understand the concept of the Easter egg hunt. So he had been told that he was supposed to find these eggs, and he had a basket. And so if you, if you watched him, he would walk out there, and he would find an egg, and he'd get really excited, and he'd pick it up, and he'd show it to everybody. And then he put it back down. And then he'd go on and get the next one and pick it up and show it everybody and put it back. He didn't have any eggs in his basket. He found them, but he didn't get the concept of keeping them. So we had to kind of explain it to him. I wonder sometimes if that's what we do with our faith. When we come to Christ, he offers us forgiveness for our sins. He offers us freedom from death, a resurrected eternal life. And sometimes we see it and we're glad to have found it. We may even sing songs about it and tell other people. But do we actually take it and keep it? He told a parable about that. He said once there was a man who found a treasure hidden in a field. And he went away and, went away and sold all he had and he bought that field. He said that's what the kingdom of God is like. He didn't buy the field so that he could move on to something better. He bought that field just so he could have it. Because the treasure was so valuable he wanted to keep it. God's rule or God's reign in our life is like that. It's worth everything else that we have to have our life centered on the one who saves us. So as we go to prayer today on this Easter Sunday, let's make sure we're not just looking at the treasures that God offers us, but that we're keeping them because that's what God wants. That's what Jesus died for. Let's pray. Lord, as we come today on this Easter Sunday, we're filled with joy because we're remembering why we come to worship every Sunday. Because you have given your life and taken it back again so that you could take our lives and give them back to us, new and whole and eternal. On this day, let us not only celebrate and praise your grace, and your gifts, and your forgiveness, and your love. But let us truly receive them all over again for ourselves as the most valuable treasure we could ever possess. We ask these things in your name. And now each of us brings you our prayer and our praise during this time. Now we pray together as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. He turned toward him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. All during Lent this year, we have been in a sermon series entitled Broadway Melodies. Each week we've heard a song from a Broadway musical and used it as an entryway into the spiritual life. And we've heard some fantastic examples over the last six weeks, haven't we? Aaron brought us Bring Him Home from Les Miserables, Answer Me from The Band's Visit, Close Every Door from Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. He and Scott combined for You Walk With Me from The Full Monty. Danny Amos gave us Try to Remember from The Fantastics. Scott and Patty sang Sabbath Prayer from Fiddler on the Roof. And Marshall and Lydia Leone brought us a special arrangement of You Will Be Found from Dear Evan Hansen. In other words, we've had quite a concert during Lent. Now be honest, after hearing some of these songs, maybe some of them for the first time, has anyone gone online and downloaded them so you can hear them again whenever you want? Broadway songs are powerful because it's music in the context of story. Today we'll conclude the series with one more song. But before we get to it, I want to talk about what kind of song it is. This is what's called an I want song. Have you ever heard of that? In the classic template for creating a musical, you need a song where your main character kind of tells us who they are. And usually they tell us who they are by telling us what they want. They sing an I want song. And then the rest of the story is about them pursuing this deepest desire. If you think about it, many of the classic musicals you may have seen follow this formula. For example, The Little Mermaid. What did she want? Her I want song, Part of Your World, is basically a textbook example. Now, some of you are from a certain generation. You know the whole song. Look at this stuff, isn't it? You know, I'm not going to sing it for you, but... She goes on to say, I want to be where the people are. I want to see, want to see them dancing. She finishes, out of the sea, wish I could be part of that world. And sure enough, that's what the rest of the story is about. So lots of musicals have a song like this, an I want song. A few more examples. I just can't wait to be king from The Lion King. That's his I want song. Wouldn't it be loverly for my fair lady? All I want is a room somewhere far away from the cold night. She wants to stop selling flowers on the street and, and do something different. How about Hamilton? My shot. When are these colonies going to rise up? That, that's kind of the I want song, right? I have confidence from Sound of Music. As she walks down the street swinging her guitar, she's singing about wanting to become the perfect governess. And in fact, she kind of does. By the way, several years ago, Stacy and I went to Australia, or Australia, Austria for our 20th anniversary, and we took the Sound of Music tour. 
And while on the tour, I made Stacy take pictures of me in all the places where Maria had been. <clears throat> so I have a whole bunch of them. What can I say? Some of us really like musicals, okay? Today's song is another example of an I want song. But it comes from a much less well-known musical. It's from the 2005 musical of Little Women. Chances are you've never heard of this. It was very short-lived. Uh, it only had 137 perf performances on Broadway. But it did produce the song that we'll hear today. The main character, a young woman named Jo, is an aspiring writer in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. But at one point, not too far into the show, a young man proposes to her. They're not really in love. They don't know each other that well. But she has a chance to step into kind of the expected script that was prescribed for most women at that time. But she decides that she wants something different. She wants to write her own script. She doesn't want to be ordinary. She doesn't want to be normal. She wants to be astonishing. So from Little Women, here's our own Lydia Leone singing Astonishing. I thought home was all I'd ever want My attic all I'd ever need Now nothing feels the way it was before And I don't know how to proceed I only know I'm meant for something more I've got to know if I can be Astonishing There's a life That I am meant to lead A life like nothing I have known I can feel it And it's far from here I've got to find it on my own upon my skin a life of passion that pulls me from within a life that I am making to begin there must be somewhere I can be astonishing astonishing Astonishing, astonishing, Atlanta. 
Pretty awesome, huh? Uh, the only problem is we seem to have perfected the recording and filming of songs at the end of the series, you know, so <laughs> starting next week, we're going to go back and do all the songs over. No, we're not going to do that. But I have really enjoyed this series and all the talent that we've seen, and I'm very proud and grateful for everyone who's participated. It was just like two and a half weeks ago that I called Lydia and said, by the way, we're extending the series one more time, and I got to, I, I've cast you. Oh, okay. You know, so she does it. Today is Easter Sunday. Today is the day that we celebrate the most important event in our faith. I would say the most important event in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus. Because of Jesus' resurrection, everything can be made new. Sin has been stripped of its power. Death has died. The world can be reborn to real and eternal life. So, what you're wondering is, what does that all, all that have to do with this song from Little Women? Well, let's look at our scripture for today and we'll see. Today's passage is about the first person who encountered Jesus after his resurrection. It was not by accident that she was chosen to be first. And her reaction is both inspiring and instructive for the rest of us. So let's look at it. John chapter 20, starting in verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. We actually need to start at the very first word of this passage. This translation says, now. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. But a more literal translation, and probably better, would be, but. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. In other words, John seems to be contrasting what Mary did with what others did. Namely, the others who he's just been talking about in the previous section. At the beginning of this chapter, Mary Magdalene was the first to discover the empty tomb. And she went and told Peter and John. They ran to the tomb, went inside, looked around, and then went away. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. She can't go away. She can't just leave know, knowing that something has happened to Jesus' body. She has to do something. I don't think the point is to blame Peter and John for their reaction. Everybody reacts to shock and grief differently. The point is to show us Mary is committed. She loves Jesus so much. He is her whole world. So she's not going anywhere. And because she was still there, she saw what happened next. It turns out the tomb isn't empty. There are two angels. Did you notice what they asked her? Woman, why are you crying? The emphasis here is not on why, but on crying. It's sort of a gentle way of reprimanding Mary. They're basically saying, this is not a time for crying. This is a time for, but Mary kind of cuts them off and answers their question from her limited perspective. She's crying because the worst possible thing that could have happened, the cruel, violent execution of Jesus, has somehow been made even worse still because someone has stolen his body. They have taken my Lord away. In this painting of the scene, I like how the angels are holding their robes to their mouths. What does that gesture look like to you? To me, it looks like kind of a polite way to keep from laughing. If so, they're not laughing at her grief. They're laughing because if she only knew what was really happening, she would be joyful too. No one has taken Jesus. They took him before and killed him. But from now on, he will do the taking. To this day, you have to watch yourself with Jesus. If you're not careful, he'll steal your whole heart away. But Mary doesn't know what's really happening. 
And the angels might have told her, but they were interrupted. And now we see the other reason that they're trying to contain their joy. Because they see the one that she's really looking for. The person she's about to meet, in a way, for the very first time. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. There's kind of a funny history of the interpretation of this particular passage. Some artists in painting this scene through the centuries have tried to explain why Jesus mistook, or Mary mistook Jesus for the gardener. So they depicted Jesus wearing a big floppy hat and carrying a shovel. Uh, I don't think that's what it was, but still, if you look in the background, you can see Peter, John, and Mary at the tomb earlier with the angel in the background. And Peter seems to be covering his face in embarrassment as if to say, I don't think that's what that means. I don't think Jesus should have a shovel and a floppy hat. But I know the artist didn't intend it that way, but that's what it looks like to me. So if it wasn't a floppy hat, which I don't think it was, why did Mary mistake Jesus for the gardener? Some people say she was blinded by her tears. Maybe so. But more than that, I think she was blinded by her expectations. Jesus being alive just wasn't anywhere in her mind. It wasn't a possibility. So even when she saw him face to face, she still couldn't really see him. That explains the question that Jesus asks her. Who is it you are looking for? He knows she's looking for him. But does she know who she's really looking for? Is she looking for who she knew before? The person she thought she knew completely? Or does she want to find the real Messiah? Who he truly is, even though it may mean a lot more than she thought. Whenever Jesus asks a question, we would do well to think about how we want to answer who is it you are looking for? Because Jesus, the real Jesus, will not only steal your heart, he'll radically change your whole life. But Mary still doesn't really understand what's happening. What is it that causes her to finally see the truth? Jesus calls her by name. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Do you remember when Jesus described himself as the good shepherd in John chapter 10? He said, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. What does that mean, he calls his own sheep by name? It means that he knows each one. And he loves each one. Even with all its flaws and fears and weaknesses, he loves each one. Jesus knows you. The real you. Even those parts of yourself that you never show to anyone. The parts you don't even like to think about. He knows. And he loves you. The whole you. The real you. Knowing Jesus means being okay with him knowing you. Being glad that he knows the real you. That's the only way that we can truly accept him by accepting his love for the real us. Jesus knew Mary. And when he called her by name, she finally knew it was him. And she was overjoyed. And she seems to have grabbed on to him somehow. We know that because of what Jesus says next, verse 17. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. The first part of this verse is one of the most difficult to translate in the entire Bible. 
When Jesus says, do not hold on to me, scholars come at it from lots of different approaches and end up with lots of different perspectives. Here's the short version. He probably is not saying, do not touch me. How do we know? Because later in this same chapter, he invites Thomas to touch his hands and his side. Do you remember? That's, when Tom, that's what Thomas said he would need to believe that Jesus had been resurrected. And when he gets there, Jesus basically tells him, go for it. Touch all you want. So if he isn't telling Mary that he can't be touched, what does he mean? Don't hold on to me is probably pretty close. Don't cling to me. Don't try to keep me here. Don't hold me in place. Why? Because Jesus has more that he needs to do and more that he wants Mary to do. It's a huge realization that she's just come to that Jesus is alive, but it's not over yet. There's work to be done. Jesus is alive, which means there's still work to be done. Resurrection means a new start. A new chance to create a new world with new power. Mary seems to have been so happy about what's just happened, Jesus being alive, that she wants to stay right where she is. You can hear that idea in that famous old hymn, In the Gardens. Anybody know that one? And he walks with me and he talks with me. It was written about this moment, this garden when Mary Magdalene is with the resurrected Jesus. She's the one speaking in that hymn. Do you remember the third verse? I'd stay in the garden with him, though night around me be falling. But he bids me go. Through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. In other words, even though I'd rather stay right here in this moment, I can't because he doesn't want me to. Jesus wants me to hear the woe in the world all the sorrow and need as his voice. He wants me to go and be with him there. Loving Jesus doesn't mean holding on to him for ourselves. It means following him out into the rest of the world. Resurrection means a new start, a new chance to create a new world with new power. And now we finally come to the connection to today's song. In a way, our whole world is about to undergo a resurrection. We're about to come out from this time of pandemic. Probably won't be tomorrow or next week, it may, or, or several months, but at some point, we're going to be able to undo all of these restrictions that we've had for more than a year. It's almost like we've been entombed since before Easter last year but we're about to come out of it. And the question is, what will we do when we come out? Will we attempt to go back to the way things were? Or will we go on to the way things could be? If we're honest, most of us can easily become clingers. Often we don't like change. We want things to stay the same, or even to go backward to some time in the past. Why is that? I think it's because we often react to change the way that Mary Magdalene did that day in the garden. What she expected was for Jesus to be dead and in the tomb, and she thought that that would never change. And to be fair, that does seem like a safe assumption most of the time, okay? But when it did change, when it was something other than what she expected, all she could see was what was no longer there. They have taken my Lord away. In other words, all she could see was what was being lost. She couldn't see what was coming in its place, which turned out to be way better. Is that what happens to us? When things change, when new things happen at church like live streaming and Zoom meetings and new ministries and new leaders, when new things happen in the world around us, like technology changes and cultural changes and all kinds of other changes, when new things happen in our families, those grandkids have a whole new way of looking at the world and engaging with the world. 
When things start changing, can we only see the old things that are being lost? Or can we see the new things that are coming for what they really are? Can we believe that God might be able to work through the new things just as well as the old? Maybe even better? I don't think Jesus wants us to be what we were last year before the pandemic changed everything. I don't think he wants us to be like everyone else with all the same goals as the culture that surrounds us. I think he wants us to be, in the words of today's song, astonishing. What did she sing? A life of passion that pulls me from within. A life I am making to begin. There must be somewhere I can be astonishing. Here I go and there's no turning back. My great adventure has begun. I may be small but I've got giant plans to shine as greatly as the sun. Do we really think that Jesus came and died and rose again so that we could be like everybody else? Resurrection means a new start, a new chance to create a new world with new power. Jesus will not be stopped in that process. Nothing can hold him back, but he wants us to come with him. Mary got it. Took her a while, but eventually she got it. She heard Jesus' instructions and followed them. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And the church hasn't stopped since. Through the next 2,000 years, the church has marched forward following Jesus. The world has changed a lot. And the church has changed a lot. And we're still not done yet. May we have the courage and the grace in our generation never to hold Jesus back, but to follow him forward. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful that you give us new and real life for our very own to make us completely and radically different. Help us never to try to categorize or put into a box or make smaller or less the plans that you have for us. We know there are things that we never could imagine. We know there are things that we wouldn't come to on our own. Give us the wisdom and the discernment and the creativity and the courage to follow where you actually lead, even if it's different than anything we've known before, even if it's different than what other people may be doing. Give us the courage to follow you as you lead us into life. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's go together to the Lord's table. I will be fearless, surrendering modesty and grace. I will not disappear without a trace. I'll shout and start a riot. Be anything but quiet. Christopher Columbus, I'll be astonishing. What if God were to sing an I want song about your life? What if God were to look at you right now, see everything in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your life, in your family, in your work, 
God were to look at your life today and then sing an I want song to start a new story, what would be in that song? Some of the stuff would be in all the songs. The Sermon on the Mount would be in all the songs. Ten Commandments would be in all the songs. All the ways that God wants all of us to live our lives. But what would be specific for you? What would be the thing that God wants you to let go of and stop clinging to? What would be the thing that God wants you to take on to allow to enter into your life that you haven't allowed before? Are there new relationships that God would want you to form? Other friendships that would be deepened? Are there ways that you would spend your time, your money, your influence differently? What would God's I Want song be for you? Because, you know, in a musical, the I Want song really does determine the rest of what's going to happen. The Little Mermaid really is going to go on the land and figure all that stuff out. When you give your life to the Lord, what God wants for you, God's will, will become a reality. That's the promise and the frightening thing about giving ourselves into the hands of God. So, what is that I want song? See if you can find time to listen for it. Once you hear one of those songs, you end up kind of humming it as you go out, right? If you, if you get the Little Mermaid stuck in your head, you're, you're going to have it there the whole time. Once God's will for your life becomes familiar to you, it just starts to set the rhythm and the melody for everything you do. So learn that song. Not what it was 10 years ago, what it is now. And see what God wants for you. That's what it means to give our lives to the Lord. It doesn't happen in one moment. It takes our whole lifetime. And now... We're in this chapter. So as we come to the table today, let's lay our whole selves, our real selves, before the Lord again and listen for what God wants. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you're willing to accommodate each of us in our individual lives. You love us enough to care about the things that matter to us to look at each life separately and love us into newness and life and wholeness. Let us not only hear and know and discern what you want, but let us cooperate. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Join me then in the Lord's table. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after blessing God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he invited his disciples, as he invites us today, to come to his table and to do so in remembrance of him.
I first heard about the concept of an I want song in a documentary I watched a while back about the man who created the music for The Little Mermaid and The Lion King and Aladdin and some of those Disney Renaissance 1990 movies. And apparently as they were creating The Little Mermaid, which was kind of a new start for Disney in a way, uh, some of the producers wanted to take out part of your world. That song is too slow, kids won't like it, they won't be able to follow it, we just shouldn't have that song. And they really argued, that the guys who were writing it, we've got to have that song because that establishes the whole story of the whole show and that's what it's all about. I heard another story once that in uh, Wizard of Oz, they thought that the song that really wasn't very good and shouldn't, shouldn't stay was Over the Rainbow. It's kind of slow, it's in black and white and nobody will like it. <laughs> that is the song that kind of sets up the entire thing. Sometimes the parts we think are less important are actually the most essential to what it's all about. Trying to follow Christ without daily asking, what is God's will for my life? Without answering Jesus' question, who are you looking for? Who do you really want? If we don't answer that question, what in the world are we doing? It's, none of the rest of it's going to make any sense. So as we come into our time of invitation, ask yourself that question. Listen to Jesus asking you the question. Who is it you're seeking? He would ask people sometimes, what is it you want? Do you want to be healed? Sometime go through and just read all the questions. Whenever there's a question mark in Jesus' dialogue, those are things we should stay on. Those are things we should listen to. What is God's will for this chapter of your life? I think if you listen hard at all, it won't be long before things start coming to you. Think on them and respond to them during this time of invitation. My name is Aaron Adair. I am the Director of Traditional Music here at First Christian Church. And on behalf of Scott Schroy, who is Director of Contemporary Music, welcome. We are so glad that you are here and that you've been participating with us in worship. I want to take a moment to uh, introduce the wonderful brass quintet. You know, for those of us that have been here uh, the entire time, it struck me the last time these guys were here were 18 months ago. It has been a long time since we've had brass, live brass music in this church, and it just sounds glorious. And you're going to have an opportunity to sing in just a moment with a brass quintet and our glorious organist, Michelle Sargent. Isn't she wonderful? While you were away, the pipes have been clean, refurbished, restored. It sounds better than ever. And I want to take a moment to introduce Michael Williams on trumpet, Emily Hicks on trumpet, Eric Fuller on tuba, Brooke Salter on horn, and the leader, the guy that brings it all together every time we need him. He's here, Jim Smith on trombone. You're going to have a chance to stand in just a moment. I'm going to take, it, take them through the prelude part of this, and then we're going to sing a glorious Easter hymn together and conclude the service in a wonderfully musical way. And for those of you in choir, don't forget, we start back on Wednesday. <laughs> Handbells, too.
we're very grateful to have the brass with us here today. And I would ask you, just the next thing, the last thing is a short postlude. And I would encourage you to stay and worship with that as well for the last second or so. But I think my favorite part of the brass today, it's all been awesome, but was in the prelude. And it was just, you know, as brass is, it's blasting and powerful. And then all of a second it cuts out to just the French horn, right? And just that plaintive sound of the beautiful melodic French horn, which to me is, I don't know, just sounds different than all the others playing underneath it. And then everything else comes back in. If we learn to listen for God's will in our life, that's what can happen spiritually. All the other stuff will fade away and we'll just hear that one underneath it all most beautiful melody, the sound of our own name. I didn't find that on Apple Music. <laughs> My watch is talking back to me. The sound of our own name being called, uh, the sound of our own name being called, not to Siri, but to do God's will. So, as we go from this place on this Easter Sunday, may God give us discernment to hear God's voice and courage to answer the call. Amen. <laughs> 